So don't worry, I got a backup recording. So, so um, behind why these exist like this is to humble you, is to make you realize that you people approach something sometimes. They go, I'm going to figure out everything on my own. You know, I'm on my own. And what this does, Allah knows that you don't know. And no matter how hard you you're not going to know because Allah didn't tell you. And if Allah doesn't tell you something, then not your best. You can figure things out. Some will never be able to figure it out. Is that Allah is in complete control of everything. And that's quite valuable. So that is the alif lam mim, and then afterwards, it says the second verse, it says this book in which there is a guide for the righteous, for people who are righteous. So now, as I mentioned last week. This is my translation, and then we're going to go back a second time, and we're going to fill in the, the blanks here, or add the uh, parentheses there. So, this book, referring to what? Referring to the Quran. So, the Quran is referring back to itself, and it's saying that there is no doubt in it. There's two meanings to this. Meaning number one, there's no doubt in this book. Meaning, if you read this book and you reflect properly, there's no doubt that you'll arrive that this is truth. This is the book that's coming from Allah. It's coming from God. And this is what happens to a lot of people. When they read the Quran, they say, you know what? I read the Quran and it just made sense. I could tell that this is a book that God would be revealed. They go and they read their own scripture or another book. And they go, this just doesn't seem like God would say something like that. So this is the first meaning of Laura Ibn. The second is that there are there's no doubt in it, meaning there's no mistakes in this book in and of itself. There's no problems in this book. There's no contradictions. There's nothing that's going to come in the future, and all of a sudden it disproves something that's mentioned in the book. Why? Because it's from Allah. Because it's from the Creator. And if if Allah is the one who's revealing this, there can't possibly be any problem inside the book. Now, this is a very heavy claim, by the way. This is an interesting claim because uh, the Bible doesn't claim this. The Old Testament that we have today doesn't make this claim. When I say Bible, I'm referring to what we have in our hands today, the modified version, right? the remnants of what was originally there. People are not going to make this claim. How many authors do you have who write a book? And they say, you know what? This is the best book that could ever exist, and you'll never find a single mistake in it. People are not that bold to even do that because they know someone's going to come along. People are going to scrutinize it and be like, oh, no, something's wrong. So number one, the claim is bold. And the claim is bold because it's Allah speaking. So he's saying there is no doubt in this book. It is a guide for people who are righteous. Muttaqeen means people who are people of piety. They have righteousness in themselves. They're trying to do good. They're good people. Good people according to? Allah standards. So this is a guidebook, right? And the guidebook for those people who are righteous people, they're people who follow the natural way which Allah has set up for them. And they don't allow these uh, diseases of the heart to overcome them and corrupt their way of thinking and corrupt their heart. And that's what the definition of righteous people meaning. If somebody wants to approach this book and they're not polluted by a diseased heart and arrogance and anger and envy and all of these things, they're going to naturally realize realize that this book is the truth and there's another aspect to it is that if you connect this verse with what came before surah al-fatiha what you're going to see is that this is exactly the prayer that muslims were making in surah al-fatiha when surah al-fatiha guide us you, my volume? Uh, which one? This one? Yeah, okay. You don't have to put your head All right. But the audio is still going in, right? Yeah. Okay. So, just now that looks, that looks unnatural. Uh, oh, yeah. So, guide no, us no, no, no. Right? on the straight path. So, we ask for from the word hidayah or huda. So, we're 
asking for guidance in Surah Al-Fatiha, this is Allah responding and saying, you know what? Here's the book. You ask for guidance. This is the book, which is the guidebook for the people who want to be righteous. So Allah is basically responding and saying, you know what? You wanted to be guided. You made the prayer in Surah Al-Fatiha. Here's the book for you. Go ahead and follow it. Next. Those who believe in the unobservable. Right? So sometimes it's translated as unseen. The word ghayb means something that you cannot actually perceive yourself directly. So you have to basically believe in it through some report, through some trusted authority, through trying to figure out from the things that you can see and you can perceive, you figure out what is beyond what is perceivable. Now, there's some people, right? They say, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. You have to show me, show me Allah. You cannot see Allah. Allah is among the ghayb. He's among what is unobservable. You cannot experience or you cannot witness him and see him in this life. So you say, well, how can I know that he exists? There's so many things that you believe in that you cannot see. All right? There's ultraviolet rays. There's certain colors on the spectrum that you can observe their characteristics. In this world, we can see the creation of Allah. We can see the effects of how Allah has ordered everything. And you can still believe in that. And yet, you're not able to see it directly, but the effects tell you that that thing exists. Right? The same thing when it comes to like uh, Stonehenge and all of these other you know, places. We go and we look at archaeological dig. You go and you say, hey, these stones are in a pr precise fashion, in a certain manner. This indicates that there must have been some civilization that existed at this time. You can't see the civilization. You don't see any remnants of them. You don't see maybe any skeletons or anything. But you know, based upon every all the other observations you've made, you can tell that, you know what, there has to have been, you know, a civilization there. There has to have been a supreme designer that made all of this. So that's part of the way. Then there's another part of the way which you cannot know except through direct revelation. So like, for example, angels or paradise or what's going to happen, hellfire, or what's going to happen after in, in the world later on. Some people, they say, no, I will not believe in anything that I cannot, anything that comes from a report from someone else, and I cannot uh, you know, experience the effects of that in any way, I'm not willing to believe in that at all. all right? This is known as a philosophy called logical positivism. We're not going to get into the details of it, but some people have had this idea. Here, it's basically saying, <laughs> it means that those who are willing to believe in something that is un un unobservable, something that you cannot have direct knowledge of but it doesn't mean you believe in everything you don't believe in every story that somebody tells you that's like kids they come and say you know i saw a ghost and i saw this i must believe in it even though it's part of the ghayb you believe in the ghayb when there's a good reason to believe it when you when you have a good source a good authority like someone who's who's a messenger of god coming and telling you that this is what's going to happen after you die and then there's a whole line of them saying the exact same thing now you have a good reason to believe in the ghayb so allah is defining this and saying those who are willing those who believe in the unseen or the unobservable and those who perform prayer and those who spend from what we have provided for them, right? So these are the three characteristics, first three characteristics of the people who are guided, right? Because it mentioned before, it says, who are those people who are muttaqeen? Who are the people who are righteous? What's the definition of a good person? People talk about this all the time. Say, so, you know, but that person is a good person. Or sometimes they talk about themselves. I'm a good person. The definition of good person among the criteria of being a good person According to Allah's definition is number one, you're willing to believe in what is unobserved. Either, you know, it's established through the witness of the prophets, right? Believing in Allah's attributes, believing in previous revelations have come, uh, believing in the afterlife and all of that stuff. The second is that you perform prayer the way that God has taught you, the way that Allah has taught you how to pray. Some people, they say, no, I'm going to pray on my own. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to sit in meditative pose and I'm going to pray the way that I want to. That's not what's being told you. Meaning that the second one is you pray the way that Allah wanted you to pray. And number three, and you spend in the cause of Allah for things that Allah wants you to spend on from what we have provided for them. So Allah mentions this specifically. He says, he puts it right in there and he says, 
we've provided you to remind you that, you know what, everything you have of money and wealth and all of that, it doesn't actually belong to you. It's not like you earned it yourself. Allah is the one who provided it for you. And the we here, this is some people get confused about this. Sometimes Allah refers to himself in the plural, not because he's a plurality, but this is called the royal we. And this used to exist in, uh, you know, whenever there's like a royal culture, you know, like the queen of England and stuff, they used to use the royal we for themselves. In fact, when I studied in India, I was studying in Lucknow. I found it very strange in the beginning because it used to be a place where there were a lot of, you know, royal families and royal influence and everything. In the language of Urdu, they used to speak in the plural. So I got very confused the first time. They said, Ham arehe, which means we're coming. And I'm getting confused. I'm like, there's only one person. I said, oh, who, who's, who are you coming with? And what he meant was he said, I'm coming. But he used the plural for himself because they used the royal we as a part of their natural language, right? So this is exactly what's being, being used here. When Allah wants to display his majesty and his power, he's going to use the royal we. When he switches to the first, uh, what, you know, what, first person or what, when he switches to I, in the, the singular first person, he's doing it to establish an intimate connection. It's like, you know what? I'm willing to forgive. Make dua to me. I will take care of whatever you need. So these both of these are manifested in the Quran throughout in the language that's being used here. Verse number four. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ those who believe in what has been sent down to you, right? Now, the you here is second person singular. You referring to one person. Because in Arabic, there's a difference between ilayka and ilaykum. Ilayka means you talking to one person. Ilaykum would be you, all of you people, all y'all. So when it's singular, and I mentioned this last week, when it's singular, ilayka to you, referring to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So Allah is saying, those people, right? It's, it's adding more. You believe, in the un, you believe in the unobservable, you establish prayer, you give in charity, and what else? You believe in what has been sent down to you. You referring to the Prophet Muhammad, meaning the Quran. So these people have to believe in the Quran, the revelation. And what was sent down before you meaning previous revelations. The revelations have been given to Prophet Musa, Prophet Moses, the revelations are given to Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus, the revelations have been given to other prophets. So you're supposed to believe in all of them because all of them have the core message is exactly the same. Only worship Allah, do good deeds, you know, don't you know commit murder and stealing and death and all of those things? Some manifestations of law may be maybe different, but the core message is exactly the same because it can't change. If all the prophets are teaching the same thing and they're all sent by Allah, the core beliefs and the core underlying moral principles cannot change. So it says you believe in all those previous revelations, uh, and they are certain of the next life, meaning the afterlife, that they're going to be judged. So these are the principal tenets of Islam. It's a summary of this is everything you need to do in order for you to be a Muslim, in order for you to be a true believer, in order for you to benefit from the Quran and to be one of the righteous people. The next verse. <laughs> those are the ones, the ones that we just described right now. Those are the ones who are following Guidance, meaning the correct guidance from their Lord. So this is a differentiating statement, meaning unlike all the other religions, other religions will say you should believe in this other thing, you should believe in karma, you should believe in reincarnation, and you should believe in the Trinity, or you should believe something about Jesus or whatever it is. All those other religions teach something. And what the Quran is saying is saying, if you do what was just mentioned, these are the core principles. These are the people who are on correct guidance from the Lord. The other people who are claiming to believe in what Allah is, you know, what God is telling them to do, there's something wrong with what's being said. But and those are the successful ones. Success in the Quran primarily always refers to success in the afterlife because that's what it means. That's the most important thing. If you weigh it, what matters the most? 
It's the long, long-term success. When you zoom the camera out of your own life, the long-term success is what matters the most. But also, you can also get some level of success by following the truth in this life as well. So it basically just simply gives you the term successful because everyone wants some type of success in their life. And the, whether it's life or next life, the idea of success, the idea of having a good life and a good afterlife and just having good in general is something that's there, it's something universal, something that everybody wants. So Allah is defining this and saying, this, this is the description of the true believers. This is what people are supposed to believe. Now comes the contrast. So it says, those who refuse to believe, it doesn't matter whether you warn them or not, because they will not believe. Now, remember the historical context always here. It says, those who refuse to believe, first of all, in Arabic, you know, in, in any language, when you mention a category of people, it doesn't mean that you mention always every single person in that entire category. It means that there are people from this category. So it's saying several of those people who refuse to believe, believe in what? Believe in you, O Prophet. Because the, the Prophet is being, is being told here, the ta means you, it's talking to the Prophet. So it's saying several of those people who refuse to believe in you, remember two thirds of the Quran has already been revealed. Many people accepted Islam, many people rejected Islam. So saying it doesn't matter whether you warn them or you don't warn them, they're not going to believe because they're closed minded. They're not interested in believing. So then you say, okay, well, what's the point of this verse then? First of all, why is it talking to the prophet? And second of all, what does that mean for us? Does that mean that like it doesn't matter? You don't need to tell other people about Islam? Because you know, it says that the people who disbelieve, their hearts are closed, they're not going to listen anyways. So why bother? You have to look back at what happened. Number one, the prophet's being addressed specifically. Why? Because he was stressed out. It was bothering him that he's conveying the message of Islam. It's been 13 years and many people are not believing in it. And he had to migrate and he had to leave his belongings behind. He had to do all of this stuff. And it's difficult for him. It's not easy to sit there and call people again and again for years and your success is very minimal. So what's happening is this verse is addressing him and saying, you know what? Those people who disbelieved in you, again, historical context, the ones who disbelieved in you, whether you warned them or you didn't warn them, they're not going to believe. So don't think that you're doing something wrong and don't get stressed out about it you know what you your job is to convey the message now do you think the prophet's going to be like oh yeah this is great i don't need to convey the message anymore i can just relax because allah said that their hearts are closed he can't do that you know why he can't do that because allah did not tell him which ones have their hearts closed he didn't tell him. so if you don't know then you're just getting a general principle the general principle is the people who refuse to believe and you warn them and you warn them and you try to reason with them and they're still not believing, then you know what? Don't worry about it. It means that these people, they're just not interested in it and there's something wrong with them. But it's not the problem. Don't think it's something wrong with you. It's something wrong with them. But how do you know which one? You look at 10 people and you're calling all of them. You say, which one of these? Is it all 10? Is it five? Is it nine? Is it one? Is it zero? What is it? So you don't know because Allah doesn't tell you the state. So the general meaning of this verse, there's a historical context, like I mentioned, and then there's a general lesson. The general lesson is you keep calling people to Islam, but if they reject you, don't worry about it. Because you know what? Allah already said, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, there are some people, no matter what you do, you can present it like this, you can present it like that. You can take them for coffee. You can take them for a really nice meal. You can, you, can, you can give them 50 proofs and arguments. You can send them all the videos and everything, and they're still not going to believe. So just don't worry about it. How do you know which ones are those people? You will not know exactly. But when you go home and you start to think about it, you start worrying and saying, you know what? You know, maybe, one, maybe they're one of those people. So I'm just not going to worry about it. And I'll continue because your job is to convey the message. The prophet's job was to convey the message. So this helps you when you realize that, you know what, 
problem is not you. You do your job and you continue and you don't lose sleep over. And then the next verse says, Khatam Allah wa ala qulubihim wa ala sam'ihim. Allah has put a seal on their hearts and on their hearing. So meaning these people who are not responding to the message of Islam, their hearts are sealed. And their hearing is sealed. Their hearing is sealed, meaning that they're hearing the words. You know, they say some people, the words go in one ear and out the other. These people, the words are not even going in at all. They're not processing at all because even though the prophet is delivering the message to them, it's just not, it's not functioning. It's not working properly. So he's saying, Allah has sealed that. Allah has sealed their hearts. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Why would Allah seal their hearts? It's because of their stubbornness. It's because of their closed-mindedness. It's because of their behavior. So then the question is, well, wait a minute. Well, why does it say that Allah sealed their heart? Why is the action being attributed back to Allah rather than to these people? Why not just blame the people and say, these people have closed their own ears. These people have closed their own hearts. Why did Allah say that Allah is the one who's closed their hearts? Because all acts in this world are actually attributed to Allah because Allah is in complete control. So what happens is when some there's some victory, say Allah caused that victory. Well, what about what about the people? What about their effort? Does it mean that their effort did nothing? No, their effort is rewarded. Allah is going to reward people for their effort. But Allah was in complete control. And if somebody lost the battle, somebody lost, you know, did something wrong or whatever, say, you know what, Allah caused that. So what about the other people? Didn't they play some role in that? When the Muslims lost the battle of Uhud, didn't they play some role in archers getting off the mountain and running and that they were criticized for it? Yes. But what happens is the way in which the Quran addresses things that always actions are primarily attributed to Allah because he's in control. This does not negate responsibility of either success or failure to other people. So this should not be confused. And you find this throughout the rest of the Quran, the two thirds that have already been revealed here. So here, this does not negate individual choice, saying that Allah is the one who caused this. And then these people come along and they say, see our hearts, Allah sealed our hearts. Not our fault. No, Allah sealed your hearts because of what you were doing. Allah sealed your hearing because of what you were doing. It was a result and a consequence of your behavior, not just some random, you know, let's just seal his heart. Yeah, we'll keep his heart open. You know, we'll just guide that person right there. That's not the way Allah acts. Allah, Allah guides, Allah acts according to what people are doing, according to justice. And it says, And on their sight is a cover. I mean, they cannot see the truth. They're not even able to see it right when it's in front of them. And these people will have a severe punishment. Meaning in the next life, they will have a severe torment, the punishment in the fire of hell. Because of what they've done, because they're rejecting their prophet. They're rejecting the message of Allah. And they're not doing all the things that the believers are supposed to be doing that was mentioned here previously. So this is the first section of Surah Al-Baqarah. And it describes who are the believers, describes who are the disbelievers and the people who reject it. Okay, I'll open it up to questions before we start with the next section. Questions. And how do we take questions from the chat? I mean, is somewhere here? Yeah. Do we take, do I, should I look at the chat? Okay, so online people can, can type their questions in the chat. Uh, this is a question. Okay, yeah. Where? I lost. There we go. So the question is really about the uh, idea of Qadr, where if Allah already knows what they're going to do, then, you know, why is he sealing their hearts and all of that? So the, the summary is that Allah knows what's going to happen, but that doesn't force people 
to do any of their actions. So Allah's knowledge does not mean that it causes them to do that thing. So when they disbelieve in the prophets or when they reject them or when they make fun of them or when they say, I'm not going to believe in anything that I can't see, that's actually a choice that Allah has given them. Even if he knows what the choice is going to be, they still have that choice and they could have picked whichever one. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Rabbis. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, you know, what about the other people who uh, are not Muslim, but they kind of have very similar beliefs like Muslims, but they don't know about Islam or something like that? Mm. Mm. All right. So at, at the end of the day, you know, Allah is going to judge everyone, right? Allah is going to judge. Allah knows what's in the hearts of people, right? So what we know is that if what's in the hearts of people aligns with what we're being told is this is what you're supposed to believe, then everything is fine. And then the one exception to the rule is if the message is not reached somebody, they're in a different situation. That's the general principle. But we can never judge an individual and say, you know what, based on my interaction or based upon some statement, you know, this must be the case. Maybe it apparently seems to be the case. At the end of the day, Allah knows. All right. Um, are there any questions online? There's like a lot of, uh, oh, here's one. There seems to be a lot of logistical questions too here. Uh, let's take a look. All right, what is the difference between the word uh, yu'minun and yuqinun in the beginning verses? Okay, yu'minun means to believe and yuqinun means to have certainty. Um, in the old scriptures as well. How is that possible when they're not preserved? Okay, so uh, believing in the old scriptures when it says to mention to believe in the previous revelations, even, say, even though they're not preserved, meaning the core of what's being taught is already coming again in the Quran. So the story of Prophet Musa is in the Quran. The story of Prophet Isa is in the Quran. So it's saying to believe in the fact that there were prophets that were sent previously and you get kind of the core of their message in the Quran, as well as you have remnants from different scriptures and stuff. You can piece together the general meaning of what their message was outside of the few, you know, modified versions here and there. They're never in in core things like for example even in the bible today you don't see jesus ever saying anywhere that you should worship me or you should pray to me you don't find that so if you look at his core teachings even in even in the books despite the accretions and modifications you won't find uh, any of those things in the core teachings let's see what else what it asks you uh, okay Maybe if, if there's another question that someone sees in the chat, you could just read it out to me, inshallah, so I don't go through all the logistical things. Is that fine? Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions before I move on to the next section? Yes. Right. So I, that were you there last week? Okay. So last week I mentioned that you know there's there's a historical context, and then there's the general lesson, and you should never confine 
any verse to the historical context only and say, oh, this was directed to the prophet. So I mentioned that, you know, what I'm going to be talking about historical context and then what is the general lesson for everyone else throughout all time. So when it came to that one specifically, I was saying that the general, the, 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 the historical context is the prophet is being told, you know what, don't worry, you know, don't, don't, don't let, don't, don't let this bother you and don't lose sleep over it. The general lesson is the same thing for us is that when we talk to people, we try to convince them, we say, you know what, this argument is airtight, so clear, why can't you see the truth? And then the person comes and just keeps on saying, no, 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 it doesn't make any sense to me. And it bothers you the exact same thing. The general lesson is don't let it bother you. And that's the explanation here. Okay. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one, inshallah ta'ala. We can at least get started. Okay, section two. So section two is about, let me give you an overview of it. So we just talked about uh, believers and non-believers and how you're supposed to react to the book. The second section is a third category of people. So there's believers, there's disbelievers, there's another category, and that's hypocrites. Though those are people who pretend to be believers, but they're actually not. And within the hypocrites, there's actually two categories as well, subcategories. There are fakers, and then there are doubters. The fakers are the one who have no belief at all, and the doubters are the one who are kind of wavering back and forth. And we're not talking about people who have conviction and then sometimes a little doubt comes and then you know they need to address it. We're talking about people who have so many doubts constantly wavering back and forth between belief and disbelief. So let's look at these verses. Allah says, There are some who say, we believe in Allah and the last day but they don't really believe at all. So now it's talking about this third category. That you know what? There are some people who claim that they're believing, but they actually don't believe. And there's two types of people here. So this verse came in Surah Al-Baqarah because one of the early Medinan revelations after the migration. This idea of hypocrisy mainly exists when Islam becomes more of a power, when anyone, anything becomes more of a powerful force then you have hypocrites. When you have an oppressed minority, you're not going to have, like in Mecca, when the Muslims were there for 13 years, not many people followed them. They were constantly being persecuted by the Quraysh. You, you, don't, you don't have a problem of hypocrites. You don't have a problem of people pretending to be Muslim because there's no, ad, there's no ad, uh, it's not advantage to be a Muslim. It's not advantageous in any way, shape, or form. So now in Medina, the situation has changed. Now, when the Prophet migrated to Medina, if you know a little bit about Islamic history, the Prophet is in control of the city. This was the city of Yathrib. Now it's been renamed to Medina. Medina al Munawar, the enlightened city. He is in control of the city. He has made a covenant with the Jewish tribes around the area. There are still some idolatrous pagan Arabs that are living there, but many of them, families, are all accepting Islam now. So Islam is becoming powerful and it basically has its own city. So now you have this massive movement of people entering into Islam. Imagine your whole family goes into Islam. Imagine you have like a big clan and all of them enter into Islam and you're like, I don't want to. Now there's social pressure. And now it's like, you know what? If I don't, I might lose my status. I'll lose my position. People will look at me and, you know, they won't respect me and they'll you know, they won't deal, maybe maybe I won't get the same business uh, contracts that I would normally get. So now it becomes advantageous for people to start pretending and say, you know what? Okay, this is, the, this is what the majority of, are doing. If you can't beat them, then just join them. But in reality, they didn't have this in their hearts. So there were two groups of people who had this. One of them was the pagan Arabs who lived in the city of Medina. These were Arabs who used to worship idols. And now that Islam is there, they didn't want to give up their idol worship. They didn't want to leave their ancestral customs and culture and all of that stuff in, when it comes to religion. But they saw everyone else doing it. So they said, you know, we're pressured. We have to do something like this. So one of them was like uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay. He was known as one of the major hypocrites. He was pretending as well. So he did something like this. And there's a second category of people. These were the Jewish tribes around Medina. And some of them were inside, living inside Medina. And some of them were doing exactly the same thing. And they were pretending to be Muslim as well. Because in the beginning, they're like, you know, well, we're, it doesn't make sense. We're so close. 
and they have the prophet mentioned in their books. So it's like, you know, what should we do? We don't want to follow him, but at the same time, it's like we're supposed to follow him. So it worked really well for them because for them, they can say we believe in Allah and we believe in the last day, but we don't want to believe in the prophet. So their wording is still technically true, but they actually don't want to believe in the prophet. So now you have these two groups and these two groups were among the hypocrites. And they're saying that, you know what? We believe, but in reality, they did not believe. So why didn't they believe? What is their purpose? They're trying to accomplish something. And the Quran calls them out on it. It says they try to deceive Allah and they try to deceive those who believe. So how are they trying to deceive the people who believe there? It's hypocrisy. They're, they're, they're being two-faced. They walk up to the Muslim and say, we're Muslim. We're with you guys, right? But then they go back and they leave and they're actually not believers at all. And it says, but they only deceive themselves. Why do they believe this? Why do they deceive themselves? They're trying to trick the Muslims. But how are they tricking themselves? Because Allah knows everything. So even if you can trick some people in this world, you can't trick Allah. So at the end of the day, your deception recoils back on you and you're going to be in trouble. And they don't even realize. They don't even understand this is happening because they can't even accept that this is the true message of Islam, that this is the true message from Allah. But they have some worldly motive, some benefit of doing this. And then they explains, there is a disease in their hearts. What's the disease? What's it? There's a disease that's preventing them from being Muslim, but it's, it's an additional disease. It's not just that they're rejecting Islam. They're not just rejecting the Prophet, rejecting the Quran, rejecting Allah in a sense. But they're actually another type of disease where you don't only reject but you go and you unjustfully go and deceive other people and pretend like you accept what you don't accept, which is, it's much worse. It's like the worst category you could ever be in. So you, you're, you're, you're rejecting the message of Allah and you're lying on top of that, you're doing both. So he's saying in their hearts is a disease. So Allah has increased their illness. This means that basically, you know, this disease naturally starts growing. If you have a disease of deceit and deception and you want to do all of these things, Allah says, you know what? I'm just going to leave you. I'm just going to let you do what you're doing. So Allah could have called them out. He could have just told the prophet, you know what? There's these seven guys. They're all fakers. Kick them out. And what would happen? Maybe they'd, they'd stop and they'd be like, oh, no, we can't do that anymore. Allah left them. And by leaving them, it increased them in the illness that they had because they kept on cheating. Deceit. Once you tell one lie, then you tell another lie. Then you tell another lie. And you keep on going more and more and more. And this is what Allah has done. Allah has increased them in that disease. And they will have an especially painful torment because of their lying behavior that they're engaging. They're lying. And this this, this uh, tendency to lie like this and to deceive is going to give you a special type of punishment. This is not just a, a normal punishment. This is going to be particularly afflictive because you're disbelieving, you're rejecting, and you're lying on top of that. So I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But uh, this happens in every, every time there's some type of ideological movement. You're going to find three categories of people. You're going to find a group of people who support it 100%. They're willing to give their blood, their money, their life. They're willing to give everything for this cause. Then you're going to find another group of people who reject it. And they're going to give their money and their life and their blood to fight against it. Because they completely disagree. They, they hate it. They can't, they can't stand its existence. And then there's going to be the type of people in between who like to play it safe. And they're waiting and they're watching. They're saying, you know what? Is this, is this movement going to be successful? Is it going to fail? And they're, they're on neither side. But they're like, you know what? We're kind of like, when it's a little bit on the success side, oh, maybe we should support that group. And then it starts to fail a little bit. No, no, no. We should go back with that group. These are the people who don't want to sacrifice anything. And you find them in, in, every, in every era. You always find people like that. And those are the ones who fall in the hip hypocrisy category.
So this is exactly what Allah is describing. Allah is calling the, them out for this. And, it's say, and he's saying that these people are someone you should be very cautious of. Why, is, why are they being called out? Because remember, this was revealed in Medina. The Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Muslims, they're dealing with these people. They didn't have to deal with them in Mecca. Now you have a group of people who are there. They're infiltrating the Muslim community, and they're very dangerous. They're more dangerous than the disbelievers because at least the disbelievers, they're openly your enemy. What's more dangerous than your open enemy is your secret enemy who's right next to you. They stand next to you, and they smile, and they shake your hand, and they hug you, but they actually hate you, and they're plotting against you. These are the worst people that you could ever find, and Allah is going to give them the worst punishment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. So um, any questions? I guess I'll open up for questions here, inshallah. Uh, I'll take one there. Uh, I, I can't hear you. Of Akhira? Baqara. Baqara? Okay. Yeah, cow. Okay, so first of all, the translation of Surah Al-Baqarah, Baqarah means cow in general. So that's what it means. Second one is I did not start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim because it's not considered to be the first verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. But you're, yes, Surah Bismillah Rahman Rahim is part of Surah Al-Baqarah. It's the prelude to it as well. So it's not that it's not there. It's there as well. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if someone did something wrong when they were little uh, and they followed the wrong group or something like that with the wrong intention, yes, when you grow up and you realize it was wrong, you ask Allah for forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. Inshallah. Okay. talking about the subcategories of hypocrites yeah so we, we haven't got to the details yet so we're about to get to the details it's going to be in next week in this one it's when it talks about hypocrite it's talking primarily about the beliefs of islam not just the actions or like some going here, going there. It's talking primarily about beliefs. Okay. Well, there could be a, another category of hypocrisy where if you know you're praying inside the masjid, you're praying in the mosque, and you know you start praying longer because people are looking at you. That's type of arrogance and showing off. The type of it's the type of hypocrisy. But this is not the same hypocrisy that's being addressed here. Yes. Okay, so the question is, is passive belief considered hypocrisy, where someone is like, you know, I'm Muslim, but I don't really practice much or something like that. So the thing is, first, there is a division between beliefs and actions. If somebody believes and they have firm belief in Allah and his messenger and the Quran, there are some people, they don't do good actions, so they don't do what they're supposed to be doing, but they still have this love for Allah and his messenger and the Quran or something like that. 
you know, this is primarily talking about belief. The second thing, though, is if someone's belief is very strong, there's supposed to be a connection between beliefs and actions. So something is wrong with the belief if the actions are not there. So somebody needs to be working on it. So they may have some kind of attachment to maybe the book of Allah or something like that. It comes, it manifests. All of a sudden, there's something in their heart that comes out. But there are layers of like spiritual illnesses that are covering you know, that love from manifesting properly. So yes, people can have uh, maybe a strong faith hidden up, but then it's not manifesting itself because there's other problems that are that are coming in the way and they need to remove those. So at the end of the day, you know, Allah is going to judge everyone, right? And we can be like, well, what about a person who does this, but then doesn't do this? What about a person who doesn't do this, but then they do this? Allah is going to judge everyone. What we should do is we should always focus. This is why Allah gives us this categorization. What you should do is you should do the beliefs and the actions the way that Allah wants you to do. That should be the goal of everyone, right? And avoid doing from the other thing. So the idea of passive belief, Allah is going to judge. It's definitely a problem. And if you get too close to the borderline here, definitely in very much danger. And if you get a little bit cl more closer and closer to becoming you know, better and better, that's what you want. Constantly improving yourself to get to the state of correct, full certainty and belief. Okay, behind. Yeah. Okay, so the question is what is the difference between someone who has a strong belief and someone who becomes an extremist? An extremist is somebody who doesn't understand the religion correctly. It's not that they have a strong belief. So they may say, you know what, I follow the Quran 100% and everything. But then when they're following it, they're not actually understanding it. They're doing the wrong things that they're not supposed to be doing. That doesn't indicate strong belief. Just because someone says, you know what, I'm going to make my life extremely difficult. I'm going to stand outside in the sun while I'm fasting. You say, man. That person has strong belief. No, actually, the prophet talked about someone who has did that. And he called him an extremist. He said, this is extreme. He didn't say you have strong belief because you're standing in the sun while you're fasting. So you're sweating and it's really hard for you. You're not supposed to do that. So that's not actually strong belief. Sometimes it, it, it may come across like that, but it's, it's actually not. That's just a, that's a, maybe he has belief, but he has an incorrect understanding of how to practice Islam. Okay. Good question. Yeah, they consider hypocrite. If somebody tries to change the meaning of the Quran and it's clear cut, and they're like, no, but I want the Quran to mean something else. They're actually rejecting the Quran. It's not about being hypocrite. It's about actually not believing in what the Quran as it is. Right? So if someone says, you know what, uh, I want, you know, I want to believe in the Trinity, but I want to believe in the Quran as well. Or I want Jesus to be God, but I want to believe in the Quran as well. Someone does that or tries to say, you know what, I think alcohol is fine, not prohibited in Islam. They change the Quran. This is very problematic, right? So Allah is going to judge them at the end of the day. But generally, if something is clear cut and you change it, it's going to take you outside the fold of Islam. Now, if you believe in it, but then you don't do it, at least you're still in the fold of Islam. And eventually, just stop doing what you shouldn't be doing. Yes. Why are there different recitations of the Quran? That's a really long topic for another day, inshallah. inshallah. There's different, the short answer is that there's different ways to recite the Quran. There were so many different tribes and different dialects. So Allah wanted to make it easy for them. So he allowed different styles of recitation. That's why. Well. Okay, we'll leave it at that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give us a correct uh, understanding of Islam and uh, help us to apply it in our lives. Ameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.